The World Boxing Association lists the following as fouls in the ring, and you're not allowed to do it. Number one, no headbutting. Number two, no hitting below the belt. Number three, no holding your opponent. Number four, no blows on the back of the head. Number five, no hitting on the back, i.e. kidney punches. Number six, no hitting the opponent at the command of break, time, or at the sound of the bell. Number seven, no hitting the opponent while he is down. Number eight, no treading on the toes of your opponent. Number nine, no hitting with your knee, elbow, or forearm. Number 10, no attacking while holding onto the ropes. And this one for Mike Tyson, no biting off of your opponent's ear. And so that's actually, that's not listed in the official rules, but it might be now. I don't know. He did that to Evander Holyfield. Don't you wish in some of the fights, maybe you saw it growing up at home or maybe that you've participated in, that there were rules that people followed when they were mad at each other. Things that you would and wouldn't do. Well, that's what Terry and I, uh, shortly into our marriage, literally within the first year of our marriage, we realized neither one of us knew how to uh, handle uh, conflict. And uh, uh, so we sat down and came up with several things. We wrote down. Those became our rules of engagement, so to speak. We called it how to have a good fight. A good fight is not where one you know, wins and the other one loses. It's mutually satisfactory to both. And we uh, picked all of our... Uh, things from scripture and some not uh, but anyway I'm going to give you uh, I've kind of boiled those down to five we started that last week uh, and we're going to continue with that today did you do you know that uh, how you handle or don't handle conflict in marriage has a direct impact on the satisfaction level of your marriage and did you know that resolving conflict successfully uh, uh, helps the longevity of your marriage. I went through some styles of uh, conflict last week. I'm not going to go over that today. You can look that up on YouTube or on our uh, website. Go back and see these series on all in the uh, the family, all in the family, these particular on how to have a good fight. Um, So I want to review. I want to review. First of all, how to have a good fight. Number one, forgive freely and quickly. This, This may be one of the most important. Uh, not only for between husbands and wives, but for, for you and everybody else in the world. Between you and every person that you've ever come in contact with, every person that you will, because sooner or later, now you know this, sooner or later, people are going to disappoint you and hurt you. And you know what? It's true the other way around too. You're going to do the same to other people. Other, other people, Because the reality is nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect, and, and, but conflict doesn't have to be conflictual. It doesn't have to be, you know, terrible and all out, um, uh, just, just letting it fly, uh, but it has a direct result uh, to, you, to your marital satisfaction. But forgiving freely and quickly, Ephesians 4, 31, 32, by way of review, get rid of all bitterness, rage, rank, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Uh, be kind and compassionate to one another. You know, you got to get rid of the anger and all that in order to be kind and compassionate. Because if you're not getting rid of the anger, you're not going to be kind and compassionate. It's kind of like those two things go, go hand in hand. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. And our model for forgiveness is just as God in Christ forgave us. And none of us deserve forgiveness. Sometimes you hear people say, they don't deserve to be forgiven. Nobody does. Nobody deserves. You don't deserve. I don't deserve. None of us deserve to be forgiven. Forgiveness is a gift of grace that's totally undeserved. And then we talked about forgiving quickly. Ephesians 4, 26, 27 says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So, you know, sundown's about 6 o'clock tonight, 6, 6 05, something like that. So you got till sundown. And literally what it's what it literally meaning is don't carry today's anger into tomorrow. Uh, deal with it quickly. So even if your anger is justified, even if somebody has legitimately offended you, hurt you, this, this, this still applies. Get rid of it before the sun goes down. Because it's your worst enemy. It's your worst enemy, and it's the worst enemy of your relationships with people around you. So I wanna, this is some new territory that I'm going to share with you right now. Some interesting facts about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness and anger are synonymous. Heads and tails of the same coin. 
unforgiveness and anger. If you're angry at somebody, you haven't forgiven them. If you haven't forgiven them, then, you, then you're angry with them. And, and so that, that just goes hand in hand. So, <clears throat> number one, we forgive in order to heal the pain of the wound. We forgive in order to heal the pain that's been inflicted upon us. So in that sense in that, uh, of the word, that forgiveness is, is, is for the forgiver because it heals. It's the only thing that heals that woundedness. It's the only thing that heals the woundedness. There is nothing else that can heal that woundedness. Let me say it again. It's the only thing that heals the woundedness. Nothing else can, nothing else will. You can numb, you can deny, you can stuff, but if you bury it, you carry it, you can medicate it, you can do all kinds of things. But until you forgive, that is still there and the pain is still there. So unforgiveness diminishes the serotonin levels in the synapses in our brain, bringing on depression. Did you know that? That's well documented. It, serot- you like serotonin. Now, you might not know anything about ser- uh, neurotransmitters, but we all like serotonin because we, we like the way that it makes us feel. It's kind of like the happy neurotransmitters. And we don't need to go into all the details of it, but you just need to know this, that when you stay in a state of anger, i.e. unforgiveness, the serotonin levels in your brain go down, and when your serotonin levels in your brain go down, depression sets in. And many of the leading uh, antidepressant medications that are on the market have a subtitle called SSRI. So SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. And what that simply means is it works to keep the serotonin levels constant in the synapses in your brain, and thus it moderates the symptoms of depression, but it does nothing to cure depression. It's like taking an aspirin for a toothache. If you get a toothache, your tooth doesn't hurt because you have a lack of aspirin in your body. But the addition of aspirin in your body will help the pain at least be diminished. So unforgiveness tightens the muscles in our body. It decreases our circulatory system's ability to take nutrients to the cells and removes waste from the cells. So ever so slightly, a body tenses up. And it literally affects the circulatory system in our body. Unforgiveness causes our body to continue to release cortisol into our bloodstream, weakening our immune system, thus making us more susceptible to anything and everything that's out there. Did you know, did you know that unforgiveness did that? Staying in a state of anger and unforgiveness weakens your immune system. Now, I didn't say that it makes you sick. It just makes you more susceptible to anything and everything that's out there. It weakens our immune system. Uh, unforgiveness, anger is a leading cause of headaches, muscle aches, joint aches. Part of that's because of that tightening up of our bodies uh, ever so slightly uh, or more intensely. Uh, and unforgiveness decreases our creativity, literally our ability to think. It's like squeezing a hose, you know, water's flowing through it, and you squeeze the hose, there's still some water that gets out. But uh, that's, what, that's what unforgiveness and anger does. It, 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 it starts to affect our creativity, our thought processes. It affects relationships around us. And I want to share one uh, interesting, <laughs> very challenging uh, scripture on unforgiveness. And, and I'm not going to take time to go through this entire story that, that Jesus gave uh, about forgiving. But it's in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. I, I, I would... I would encourage you to make note of that passage of Scripture and and to read it. If you have a problem with forgiving, if you have all kinds of reasons in your mind why there's somebody that hurts you, whether it's recently or in your past, you know, from a a day ago, a year ago, a decade ago, or half half a century ago, if you've got reasons in your mind that you say, I'll never forgive that person, I'm never going to forgive that person, I, I just, I, I just want to lovingly, encouragingly uh, encur- challenge you to read Matthew 18, 21 through 35. So Jesus tells this story about a guy that for, was forgiven a huge amount, like close to $12 billion in our economy. And, uh, and then he wouldn't forgive somebody that owed him, by comparison, about $10,000. I mean, that, that's still a significant amount if somebody owed you 10000 But the idea there is the contrast between the two. And, and then the guy that wouldn't forgive, uh, he was forgiven by the king. So the king calls him back in and says, why didn't you forgive? I forgave you. You should have forgave him. You know? and, and then the king says this, uh, have him thrown in jail where he'll be tortured until he pays back everything. So pain and imprisonment. And then, now this is a shocker, folks. 
I almost hesitate to tell people that Jesus said this. This is, to those of us who are followers of Christ, the most in-your-face thing that Jesus ever said to us. I'm convinced of that. So, pain and imprisonment. And then Jesus said, this is how my Father will treat you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Brother includes your wife, your son, your daughter, father, mother, sister, brother, neighbor, co-worker, parent, whatever. This is how he'll treat. So what I think of that is, you know, my dad used to spank me and ground me. Pain and imprisonment. For my own good, right? It's like you got to learn a lesson, Jeff. And our father loves us enough to teach us a lesson. Why? Because of all the reasons that I just went through. And by the way, all those are scientifically documented. Uh, I found them by doing a simple Google search and during reading the research, uh, not just by Christian organizations, but by universities literally around the world. You can do the same thing in a heartbeat. Anyway, and you, can, you find out that unforgiveness, staying in a state of anger and unforgiveness is our own worst enemy. Uh, So much damage comes because of that. So I'm going to move on now. This is also a review from last week. This is where we ended up. Number two, and this goes hand in hand with forgiveness. Don't bring up the past when it's been addressed. Don't bring up the past, even if it's a repeat performance. There you go again. Now We've got to learn to deal with one issue at a time and, and, and face it, resolve it, and even when it's repeated, don't bring up... So some of the ways we do that was using simple words like always and never. Sometimes it's just blatantly we throw things in, the, in, in their face. Sometimes all those things that we've swept under the rug because we really haven't dealt with it, they come out from underneath the rug in and, and the latest conflict, the latest uh, thing when people are upset. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. I don't know that God literally forgets because then he'd have a gap in knowledge and that's a theological problem for us to wrestle with like how many angels can sit on the head of a pin but it really doesn't matter. But does God literally forget or is it a matter of that he does not remember us according to our sins? He does not treat us like our sins deserve. Psalm 103 tells us that. So don't bring up the past when it's been addressed. Let's move on to new territory now. New territory. And this one's admit when you are wrong. So I've got about a six minute video also from the skit guys. We do use a lot of their videos because when you get their videos, they come with the streaming rights so that we can put them on the internet. So that's pretty cool. Watch this. I think you'll like it. An epidemic is spreading across the nation. People don't talk about it because it's vile and disgusting. However, we here at Great Line want to expose this virus, try to put an end to its surging rise to normalcy. This sickness is called double dipping. Double dipping takes place in public and private settings. This is where an individual takes a chip, dips it, takes a bite of it, and then re-dips or double dips the chip back into the bowl. Double dipping a chip after taking a partial bite is a dining sin or at least a cultural faux pas. In essence, the chip must be pure. A bit chip is putting everyone at risk for a common cold, but much worse, it just looks sick. We find Jim Ruffle, a local waiter at El Guapo Mexican restaurant. Hello. Well known in his community, a churchgoer and a double dipper. Jim thinks he's coming over to his buddy's house to watch the game and partake in his buddy's chip and dip. Great Line is there with cameras rolling as we get the whole thing on tape and expose Jim for what he really is. Hello? Hey, Gary. Gary, where are you? Gary, game's about to start. Hi, Jim. How are you? Hey, hey, hey. Where's Gary? He's upstairs. Actually, he'll be right down. I brought some chips. Well, good. Set them down with the rest. Help yourself to the dip. Okay. Enjoy the game. All right. Jim doesn't waste any time. It's obvious why he's here. And like almost every double dipper we've seen, Jim looks to the left, 
then the right to make sure no one knows what he's about to do. Little does he know, we have a surprise for him. Hi there. Oh, please, have a seat. Enjoying the chips? Yeah, they're good. And the dip? No, it's good, too. Where's, where's Gary? Gary's safe. Let's talk about you. What do you want to talk about me for? You, sir, were double dipping. No, no, I wasn't double dipping. Please, sir, we both know what just happened here, and you double dipped. I, I, I didn't mean to. I, no, I don't think I did. I you think, don't think no, you did? Don't you don't you mean to? Well, no. Sir, answer me this. What is uh, this? Is this not a half-eaten chip with your saliva on it? That was in there when I got here. It was in there when you got here? Yes. It, is that nacho cheese dip not have French onion dip swirled in it? Did the French onion dip grow legs and crawl in there? I, I don't know how the evolution process works. It may you have. Don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So are you going to tell me that you didn't communicate to Gary using the screen name Salsa Forever 12 and suggest the idea of double dipping? What? I don't know. M maybe. I don't, you don't know. No, it wasn't maybe. intentional. The problem is, sir, I have the transcripts right here from your chat room. What Jim didn't know is that he wasn't talking to Gary at all. He was actually talking to a member of Picante Justice, posing as Gary online. What's a party without chips? Will there be dip? Lots of dip. Gotta make sure get a lot of bowls for all the people. Why? One big bowl for everyone to dip out of is great. Aren't you afraid of double dipping? Don't knock it till you've tried it. L O L. So, sir, you admit this is you. Yeah, but but I've never double dipped. Until you've never double dipped. No, until I, today. I don't. I don't even like dip. You don't like no, dip. No, I don't like sir, dip. Sir, can no. you see yourself? You're you're petting the dip even as we're speaking. Okay. Okay. You know, okay, look, I, I just I just came to watch the game with Gary. You came to watch the game. Yeah, I wasn't planning on coming to the door going, you were oh, today, today I'll double dip chips or something like no that. No plans at all. That wasn't my plan at all. No, no I wouldn't even think you Really? Did. Who are you and why so, are you asking me these questions? What's in the bag, Jim? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Really? Yeah, really. What, what are you getting at? What are, who are you? What, are you, what does all this mean? I don't... This is the part where I tell you that I'm Kurt Chanson with the TV program Great Line, and we're doing a show on people who intentionally double dip their chips. Okay, look, I, okay. When I was a kid, I had a lot of fun dip, okay? I had a lot of fun dip. Fun and, dip. and it was fun, and it was dip, and, and it just got out of control, okay? It's not my fault. It's not your fault. No. Jim, we all have secrets from our past, but at some point, don't you think we have to take responsibility for our own actions? I just like dip. You like dip? Yes, I like dip. Jim. Stop it! The sad truth is, most of these double dippers are living among us in our neighborhoods. And most states are doing nothing about it. But the real question is, what are your secrets? What is it you find yourself looking to the left and then to the right about? Making sure nobody's watching. Next time, be careful. Or you just might find me, Kurt Jansen, waiting to catch you. So what wasn't Jim doing? He wasn't admitting when he was wrong. And, you know, if you're not careful, you might find yourself in that. Uh, I know I have. You know, in, in, in uh, excuses, denial, um, blame, taking partial responsibility. Yeah, what well, I did it, but you, you know, and we, we, we throw it back. And, and one of the best ways of helping to resolve conflict in a relationship is taking responsibility from my side of the street and admitting when I'm wrong. So we need to be willing to face that and admit when we're wrong. I saw a cartoon once of a man looking for a card to get his wife. He asked the clerk if they had a card that vaguely hinted at doing something wrong but stopped short of saying, I'm sorry. 
Some people think there's a Bible verse that says, therefore confess the sins of others. These folks have an eye disease called plank eye disease, where it's easier, isn't it true? It's easier to see the sins of somebody else, the mistakes and the failures of your spouse when you're in an argument, and it's the but you, and we make excuses for our own behavior instead of taking responsibility for it and simply being able to say, I did it, I was wrong, and I hope that you're able to forgive me. James 5.16 says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Tim Keller says that when we sin, we're committing suicide against our own soul. The wages of sin is death. And when we sin, we're committing suicide to our own soul. But confession, honest, genuine confession, Yes, I did that, I said that, I was wrong, I hurt you, please forgive me, uh, brings the healing that our soul uh, needs. Confession is the opposite of denial, blame, justifying, uh, throwing stones at somebody else. It's taking responsibility for our own selves, our own failures, what we've done, and leaving the other persons up to them. So, admit when you're wrong. Number four, be quick to listen. I got to be honest with you. This, this, is, this is one of my biggest faux pas right here. My wife would amen that. She don't, she don't have to. I just did it for you. Uh, here, here's, here's what I'm doing usually. And, I, you know, and I've been working on this stuff for 40 plus years. You know, when, when, when I'm in a, a conflict with, with Terry, uh, it, it's, it's like I'm already thinking about my next line of defense. You know, I'm already thinking about uh, how to spin this. And so when I'm thinking about that, what am I not doing? I am not listening. I might hear the words, but I'm not hearing what's going on. James 1.19, this is a verse I said, some of these come out of context. This is one of those that's taken out of context. But it applies in, in what we're talking about. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now think about it. In, in a lot of conflict that you know of, that you've seen, or maybe that you've participated in, what usually happens is the exact opposite of those three things, where we get quick to become angry, we're slow to listen, and quick to speak. And I think there's a direct correlation between if, if I'm more willing to listen than I am to talk, if I'm more willing to hear the other person's perspective than I am to share mine, then I'll also be slower to become angry. So I want to be, we want to be quick to listen. Um, this helps us to not jump to conclusions. Have you ever had an argument with your spouse or with anybody else that you realized w when you finally settled down and were able to talk about it that it was all based upon misunderstanding? Has that, that ever happened to you? You may not be able to recall the specifics of it now, but chances are it has happened to you and then you realized this, this fight that we had was totally unnecessary. Several years ago, I um, was doing some counseling with a couple in my office in Granville, and uh, uh, they shared with me about a big fight that they had had. They had been, uh, they had purchased, ordered some uh, little pine trees, and they were planting them along the border of their property as a windbreak, sight barrier. And uh, somewhere in the midst of that, the husband said, I, I, I would like to plant these trees along our driveway. And she, she totally misunderstood him, and uh, she thought he meant take those trees that they had already agreed on, that they had already ordered, and instead of planting them where they had already agreed upon along the border of their property, to take them and plant them along their driveway, and, you know, it hit the fan. And they went back and forth and back and forth about that for I don't know how long, but it came up in counseling, and it came out that what he meant was, no, I think we should buy more of these trees at some point in the future and plant them along our driveway. But they argued about that for who knows how long, and it was, um, it was, a, it was a big deal. So there's some simple ways to get around that, you know, listening first, asking some questions. What would have been like if he'd have said, if she would have said, so what I think I hear you saying is, you want us to take these trees that we, we have right here, and you want us to plant them along the driveway instead of where we agreed to plant them? And he would have said, 
No. I want to plant these, just like we talked about, along the side of the property, and in the future, buy some more and plant them along the driveway, to which she probably would have said, oh, that's a good idea. But they both misunderstood each other. I'm not trying to paint one as the bad guy or the good guy in that. It's that they both misunderstood each other, and that crazy cycle just was spinning out of control. And so some simple questions, clarifying questions. What I think I heard you say was... Is that correct? That gives the other person the opportunity to say, well, yeah, or, well, no. Because, you know, communication is an art. It's an art. I don't know how many times I've been misunderstood by things that I've said from the pulpit. And somebody's come back to me and said said that you said that. I went, I didn't say that. I don't even believe that. I don't think, you know, so communication is up. Maybe I didn't say it very clearly. Maybe their filter heard it differently. So what you think you heard me say may not be what I really intended to say. And what I meant to say might not have been spoken clearly enough. So what you think you heard may not be what I really wanted to say. Communication is an art. It's a skill. Uh, and there's another thing about communication and in and, uh, and, 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 and this point. Don't hijack. So your spouse comes to you and says, honey, there's something we need to talk about. Well, yeah, and then they say it. Well, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I want to talk about this. You know what you just did? You hijacked their concern. You're not listening. You've made their issue your issue. And here's just a simple point of advice here, some good wisdom. Uh, Resolve the one issue and then wait and then bring up your issue. It just helps you deal with one thing at a time. Otherwise, you've got this big ball of twine and you've got knots in it and you're, taking, you're having to sort through all those different things. And the only way to do that is to deal with one issue at a time. So our rule of thumb is uh, whoever brings up an issue, that's the issue that's on the table. Uh, the other, any other issue that might pop up needs to be put aside, put it in a file, pull it out later and deal with it, but do one issue at a time. So be more willing uh, to listen than you are to speak. Now, number five, speak words that build up. Speak words that build up. Ephesians 4, 29 through 30 says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with him you were sealed for the day of redemption. That word unwholesome there, if you, it simply means rotten, putrefied, corrupted, of no use, worthless. So don't let any rotten, putrid uh, word come out of your mouth. Now, that, certainly that would apply to cursing. Cursing. I'll be honest with you, there's a plague amongst Christians today that feel like cursing is okay. It's a rotten putrid use of words and people will say well it's you know it's it's just what's just the meaning that's given by the context of our culture every word is like that every word has meaning given by context and a culture in which we live and and there there's just a plague of that in in everyday life um but the application that we're going for here is in Marriage, in in a relationship. Of course, this goes with your kids. This goes with anybody else. You know, speak words that build up. I think I told you before, I've encouraged couples to say this to each other, and I've said this to Terry. Right now, I'm really mad at you, but I love you, and I'd rather be married to you having this fight with you than not being married to you at all. I I shared that at a marriage retreat once, and somebody went to Terry and said, did he really say that to you? And she said, yeah, he has said that. That's not my go-to. It, it, it's something that I have to bear down and would have to mm, not let other words come out of my mouth. Um, so it's a choice that we make. Ephesians 4.15 instructs us to speak the truth in love. So sometimes your spouse may need to hear something from you about them, about their behavior and, and how, how they hurt you, how they offended you. But when you speak it, it says this is encouraging us to speak it in love. Speak it in a way that builds up. Speak it in a way that doesn't tear down, tear into them, 
in a way that's going to cause collateral damage to the relationship because there's a lot of things that are said and done when two people are mad at each other that just makes the whole issue worse. It's collateral damage. So not only do you have to deal with the original issue, now you've got to deal with the additional hurt and heartache that was created by things that were said and done in the midst of that conflict. Speak. Speak up. Be willing to speak up. I shared with you guys uh, in the past, last week that um, when, we, when we got married, and I could tell something was bothering Terry, something that I had insensitively done or said, and then she'd be upset or whatever. And she, her, her way of dealing with it was trying to act like everything was fine. And uh, I would say, what's the matter? And she'd say nothing. And I'd say, yes, there is. No, there isn't. And we'd just go back and forth like that. And uh, eventually I would just say, well, you know, you're lying because I can tell something's wrong. And, uh, and then eventually she would say it. And I'd go, yeah, and in, in my heart. I'm going, yeah, at least we got it out. And uh, then she'd be mad at me because I stayed on her tail like a coon, like a dog on a coon's trail. And, and uh, so we both had to agree. We both had to agree. We were both handling that wrong. She had to agree and be willing to speak up sooner. I had to be willing to say, what's the matter? And even if she said nothing, just to let it go. So we both had to deal with the uncomfortableness that that created within us. I, I, I wanted to get it out. I still didn't know how. I'll be honest with you. Even if it was out, I still didn't know how to resolve it. At least in my family, I told you, in my family growing up, we were the let it fly, let it, let it you know, hit the walls. Uh, literally, I told you about my dad throwing a plate of spaghetti under the ceiling once. And we just let words fly and, and, and hurtful things. And we never, never resolved anything. So that's what I was used to. And she was used to the nothing and uh, burying it. And uh, so n- neither one of those are helpful. Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, about those styles. Did you know this? This, this, this is <laughs> couples that just let it fly have higher levels of marital sex satisfaction than couples who just bury everything. Now, they don't have the highest level, but they have higher than those that bury it and act like everything is fine. You just let it go. And what happens is that I know of a case like this. After 50 years, the husband who was a deacon in his church left his wife for another woman, and uh, his wife said, I didn't even know anything was wrong. Burying it. That's a lifetime of burying things and not dealing with issues. Somebody has said that uh, intimacy is the pr- uh, price we pay for conflict. Maybe it's the other way around. But, um, you know, it's, if you, it's, I think it's impossible for two people. I think it is the other way around. <laughs> Conflict is the price we pay for intimacy. There we go. Um, it's impossible for two imperfect people to never have their feelings hurt with each other. I, it, it's, it, how you handle it is it totally is so much of how you gr- grew up, what you learned, what you've experienced. So much of that is true. Uh, it doesn't have to be conflictual. It doesn't have to be letting it fly and hurtful, uh, but working things out. Some couples seem to be blessed with an ability to be able to do that, to work things out. I did some premarital counseling with a couple once, and uh, this is what she said. And I knew this family uh, from church, her and her sister. She said, when me and my sister were upset with each other my parents made us sit down at the table and work it out we weren't allowed to get up until we resolved it Uh, that was some wise parents helped prepare her for going into marriage unfortunately many of us don't get that Um, so there's some things that go along with that one of the things we wrote down was don't call your spouse an idiot or any other such derogatory name Don't use derogatory names. Don't tear down. Don't tear into. Don't say you're just like your mother, your father. You know, that's, that's, take it, learn from other people's mistakes, i.e. mine. It's it's just not helpful. It's not helpful to the situation that you're in. Uh, Nobody takes that well. 
Because you're not referring to something positive. You're, when, when it's said in the heat of battle, it's something negative, right? So don't call your spouse an idiot or any other such derogatory name. Stick to the issue, not the character of your spouse. Stick to the issue, not their character. Don't defame their character. Believe the best about your spouse. By believing the best about your spouse or your kids or your parents, you'll help them believe the best about themselves. By tearing into, cutting down, um, accusing, all those things really uh, does not help the relationship. Now, we could add more and more to this list. And the honest truth is none of us live up to these. And this is only five. None of us live up to these, I don't believe. But there's one who does. There's one who is always quick to forgive. There's one who always speaks the truth in love. There's one who never tears into our character that believes the best about us and speaks words that build up and encourage. He's always more than willing to listen. In fact, he probably does way more listening than we do listening to him. And he seems to be okay with that. Of course, I'm referring to Jesus. And through faith in him, our sins can be forgiven, washed away, cleansed, remembered against us no more. Wouldn't it be great to be standing before God and he looks at our list of offenses and he says, hmm, I don't see any. They're all gone. All taken care of. There is one who lives up to all these and more. And through faith in him, we can be growing more and more and more into that direction. So I'm not encouraging us to go home and have this resolve and to take, I know people that have taken lists like this and have put them up on their refrigerator or on their bedroom mirrors, on their dresser and as, as reminders. It, it's, and and that's, that can be helpful. But this isn't a resolve into, hey, I'm going to try harder or work harder. This is really, this is what I'd encourage you. This sounds crazy maybe, but I'm encouraging you to look at that and say, Jesus, you know, I don't do this very well and I need help. I don't do this very well, and I need help. And I'm willing to open myself up to you and to the help that you can give me, to help me to grow in that. You, if you have faith in Christ and you're a believer, he lives in you. You who live within me, help me to live more the way that you live. Would you give me the strength? Because our promises and our resolutions, you know this, every New Year's resolution you made, January 1st, you've already broken right? Every one of them. And you know, that's a well-documented phenomenon as well. They usually last by the end of January. They've, we've already broken them. Gyms are full. January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. I call them migrants. They're just migrating through. Come February, they'll be gone. That's true. But that's true for all of us. So don't make the promise. Make it a prayer. Lord, I need help. I need to be more like you. And you who live within me, would you help me to be more like you? So how does Jesus treat us when we're in conflict with him? Romans 5, 8 and 10 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, i.e., while we were in conflict with him, while we were in rebellion against him, Christ died for us. Scripture tells us that that's a demonstration of his love for us. He takes the hurt, he takes the offense upon himself. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So how does God relate to us when we're in conflict with him? How does God relate to us when he's got a problem with us? He speaks the truth in love. He's more willing to forgive than we can imagine. 
He doesn't bring up the past and throw our sins in our face and like, there you go again. He's so kind. He's so gracious. And he loves you. He loves us. And with his help, we can all be a little bit more like him. So I've got some things that I like to uh, do for like keeping the conversation going. Uh, you either keep this conversation going with yourself in your own mind. Better yet, if you're married, keep this conversation going with your spouse. Uh, so which one of the five that we've gone over, if you prayerfully and diligently worked on asking for God's help, would make the biggest difference in your marriage? If you could just pick one. I, well, you, you might say, man, for me, it's all five. Okay, I, okay, I, maybe, maybe that's true. But just pick one because if you pick all five, you'll get discouraged. So if you just picked one, which one would it be? Forgive freely and quickly? Is that, is that the, the biggest issue that you feel like you struggle with? You just hold on to grudges and you don't, you don't want to forgive. You've got every reason in the world to not forgive. I'll never forgive that. You know. Uh, maybe it's bringing up the past, throwing it in the face, reminding them of the failures uh, from the past. Maybe it's having a problem admitting when you're wrong. There's an episode of uh, Happy Days. Some of you remember Happy Days. Devoted to Fonzie's inability to say, I was... The whole episode is he could not get the words out of his mouth. Admit when you're wrong. Be quick to listen. Speak words that build up. Let's pray.